Florin Kurta is an associate professor of medieval history and archaeology at the University of Florida. He studied history philosophy at the University of Bucharest, medieval studies at Cornell University, and received his doctorate in history at Western Michigan University. For his book, The Making of the Slavs, Kurta received the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize of the American Historical Association. The book represents a new approach towards the origin of the Slavs. Kurta's conception is that early medieval ethnicity was embedded in socio-political relations just as modern ethnicity is. One could agree that the problem of Slavonic or Slavic ethnicity was a result of a unique linguistic ethnogenesis. On the contrary, many other tribes were either political, ethnos, or military groups, folk, fulka, pulkas, from time to time resulting in major ethnic communities or settlements. Therefore, in past centuries, the term Slavs was created and non-critically applied to some populations and regions. However, avoiding this kind of misunderstanding, Kurta often uses the term Sklavens, a label frequently employed in the early medieval. As Kurta describes, he finds an original solution to solve the problem of Sklavenic pre-6th century presence. Instead of a great flood of Slavs coming out of the Pripet marshes, I envisage a form of group identity which could arguably be called ethnicity. The Slavs, in other words, did not come from the north, but became Slavs only in contact with the Roman frontier. To simplify, the circumstances were a crucial factor in forming the Slavonic ethnic community. For purposes of our Veneti Info project, it is Sclavenic or Venetic ethnogenesis which is most interesting. Professor Kurta speaks directly to this. Our present-day knowledge of the origin of the Slavs is to a large extent a legacy of the 19th century, a scholarly endeavor inextricably linked with forging national identities. He also challenges the reader to move away from the migrationist model which has dominated the discipline of Slavic archaeology ever since its inception. The combination of both the historical and archaeological approach could be seen as one that gives the author more freedom to revise the firmly grounded model of the early medieval Slavic mass migration. According to Kurta, among Sklavins there was no obscure progression involving a more or less permanent change of residence in the 7th century. He states, I began this chapter with the statement that the nature of the Slavic settlement remains obscure to many modern historians. Several conclusions follow from the preceding discussion, but the most important is that whether or not followed by actual settlement, there is no infiltration and obscure progression. The evidence of written sources is quite explicit about this. The problem with applying this concept of migration to the 6th and 7th century Slavs is that there is no pattern of a unique, continuous and sudden invasion. According to Kurta, there is also archaeological evidence to move away from the migrationist model. More important, assemblages of the lower Danube area, where, according to the migrationist model, the Slavs migrated from the Pripet marshes long, antedate the earliest evidence available from assemblages in the alleged Urheimat. But not only new evidence, also new interpretations seem to overthrow the idea of mass migrations. Cultures, as one archaeologist noted, do not migrate. It is often only a very narrowly defined goal-oriented subgroup that migrates. To speak of the Prague culture as the cl culture of migrating Slavs is therefore a nonsense. The key argument in modern archaeological research springs from the assumption that the Prague culture is the one proving migrations, an idea labeled by Kurta as a nonsense. He moreover points to other ethnicities as the ones responsible for the southern branch 
of the Prague culture. Such pots were hastily classified as Slavic Prague type pottery in an attempt to provide an archaeological illustration to Procopius' story of Hildegis and his retinue of Sklavin warriors. Similar pots, however, appear in contemporary children burials east of the Tisa river in Gepidia. Even where the so-called Grubenhäuser or sunken buildings are concerned, we should be more cautious. Such buildings were common in contemporary settlement of Central and Western Europe. Indeed, there is no reason to believe that archaeological particularities give any hints of a migration of a community. Kurta argues that the distribution of hordes in the Balkans would at best indicate that large tracts in the western and central parts were not touched by invasions at all. Furthermore, it was not only misinterpretations, but also inaccurate dating and flawed methods that forced the migrationist model into a cul-de-sac. Kurta cites serious methodological flaws and misdatings in archaeological approaches towards migration of the Slavs, even in the Greek territory. With this and other proofs, Kurta challenges scholars to revisit migrationist conceptions. First, there is already enough evidence to move away from the migrationist model which has dominated the discipline of Slavic archaeology ever since its inception. A retreat from migrationism is necessary simply because the available data did not fit any of the current models for the study of prehistoric migration. Cultural correspondences were too often explained in terms of long-distance migration, despite lack of any clear concept of migrations to guide such explanations. Regarding the connection between Sklavins and Veneti, Kurta's conclusion is breathtaking even if applied only to the northern Veneti. Archaeological research has already provided an enormous amount of evidence in support of the idea that the Veneti were Slavs. The failure to distinguish between various Veneti groups may lead to a link between the Baltic Veneti and the Alpine Vents or Winds. If such a link existed, the relations should be visible to us. For example, present-day Vendic toponyms could be relics of past Venetic settlements. Some of them you can see. It may be valuable to note that some of Kurta's predecessors outlined a similar approach. Archaeologist Colin Renfrew states that there is no evidence for cultural and linguistic changes in Europe which archaeological research could offer. There are also papers such as these two modern works, Venedi, first builders of European community, and Origini delle lingue d'Europa. In the former, though written by non-academicals, some arguments still find support in the historical and linguistic evidence. Colonization of Slavs in the Alps during the above time, that's the 6th century, cannot be authenticated by any historical source. It represents a fabricated, fictitious view that is repeated without critical examination. In the latter, Mario Aliné also uses a linguistic argument. I have to commence by clearing away one of the most absurd consequences of the traditional chronology, namely that of the arrival of the Slavs into the immense area in which they now live. This book is a highly interesting work for scholars who would like to evaluate or revise our present-day knowledge of the origins of the Slavs. Regretfully, these ideas have yet to merit a noteworthy discussion or echo among scholars. Mainstream thinking in this field seems to prefer simply to ignore the conception in Professor Kurta's book. A final remark. A number of genetic studies have been made recently in order to determine the structure of ancient European populations. Professor Kurta's position towards such studies is significantly absent from his book.